Welcome everyone. It's nice to see some faces finally. I've been uh, giving this presentation online for the last couple of years and to be honest I think I've been just giving it to kind of blank initials on a screen. So whether or not they were actually there, who knows. Um, but yeah, my name's Joe Palmer. I'm one of the surveyors at Right of Light Consulting. Uh, we deal primarily with daylight, sunlight and legal rights of light and that is what we're going to talk about today. So please, as JJ said, do stop me in my tracks if there's any questions on the slide that I'm on. Um, but yeah, stop me anytime if you want to ask any questions because it may, is intended to be quite informal. So please do pipe up if you have any questions. So there's going to be two parts to this presentation. The first half on daylight and sunlight, which is in the local authorities' planning policy. So it's one of the things that local authorities will look for uh, in planning applications to see if the impact on daylight and sunlight to the neighbouring amenity has been met. Uh, and that's laid out in the BRE guide, uh, which an, a new version of which was uh, issued this year in June 2022. Uh, and the second half of the presentation is going to be looking at legal rights of light, which is completely separate to planning and needs to be considered even if a development does have planning permission, uh, because neighbours can still make a right of light claim, even though you've got permission to build your extension or large development. So we're going to split that into two. So I'll start off with this, this uh, simplistic case study, which I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so on the left, we've got our uh, existing massing. On the right, we've got our proposed. So for each and every project that us as daylight and sunlight surveyors will do, uh, we will use architect's drawings, any Z mapping or point cloud surveys to create a 3D model for every single project. So we're going to be looking at the impact on neighbouring buildings by building them into a 3D model and running them through software rather than taking specific measurements of light on site. So it's all done using software. Um, so this example model, uh, as I mentioned, existing on the left, proposed in blue on the right, so obviously getting much larger. Um, and in order for us uh, to go through this today, I would be looking particularly at the impact on these windows over here. So um, the focus of our work is looking at the neighbouring amenity, the neighbouring windows and the impact on them. So the first, one of the first uh, tests that you can undertake if you're looking at neighbouring windows which look directly at your development is called the 25 degree rule of thumb test. Now if you can get your development to sit underneath that 25 degree line and it's a 25 degree line from a neighbouring habitable room window so you take it from the centre point of your window, draw up that 25 degree plane, if it intersects your proposal which as you can see it quite clearly does here then you need to do the further daylight and sunlight tests and so local authorities and architects alike can use this very simplistic test to um, see if a daylight and sunlight report, uh, which is something that daylight and sunlight surveyors uh, will create uh, to support the planning application to see if that's required. For some developments it quite clearly doesn't have an impact on neighbouring properties. If you, you know, most of the things you see on grand designs where they're in the middle of nowhere in the country, not going to have an impact on the neighbours. So it's not something that we would need to assess. But in central London locations, which is where most of our work is, almost certainly the test is breached on nearly all cases because the windows are so close together. So once this test is undertaken, we move uh, to the BRE test. So this is laid out in the BRE guide, which is the site layout planning for daylight and sunlight, a guide to good practice, and it's the third edition that was uh, released this year. Uh, it does have some new quirks, but it's very, very similar to the 2011 uh, guide that came out. Um, so there are four main tests that we undertake as daylight and sunlight surveyors. We look at two for daylight and two for sunlight. The primary test for daylight is called the vertical sky component test, which looks at the amount of visible sky that can be seen from the outside of a window. If we know the room layouts, we will undertake the daylight distribution test or the no skyline <coughs> test. That's why you can see this, this NSL here, no skyline. Um, so that's taken from inside the room um, and an example of, of undertaking that test from this position on the working plane, if I was looking outside the window, it's a measure of can or can't I see the sky from that position and we do that in the whole room so it gives a contour but we will only stipulate that that, that is done when we know the neighbouring room layouts because if we assume the room layouts of a neighbouring property, undertake that test and we, we say to the local authority, yeah, it passes all the tests it passes a no skyline test in all cases, it might actually mislead the planners if we've done it on assumed room layouts rather than the true layouts. 
So for sunlight, we undertake what's called the annual probable sunlight hours test, which looks at the amount of sunlight which is received by the outside of a window. And then the overshadowing to gardens and open spaces test is the final sunlight test we do. And that's a measure of sunlight on the ground. Uh, and that is, uh, the test is whether or not a point on the ground can receive at least two hours of direct sunlight on the 21st of March at the equinox. Uh, and we look to see whether that's implemented over the whole garden and always looking to compare the existing versus the proposed scenario. So um, we're not only looking at the absolute levels of daylight and sunlight, but the relative losses as a result of proposals to see if they're acceptable in line with the BRE guide. So in our case study, these are the neighbouring windows. So if you remember in our model, uh, the ones I highlighted before, so we've got windows one, two, three, or four, and five of this property. Now you'll note this, uh, this window down here almost certainly serves a hallway. So between numbers one and two, if you can see that, it's fairly dark. But um, the local authority are going to be concerned only with daylight and sunlight to habitable room windows. Now this quite clearly is going to be serving some form of hallway and therefore we've left <coughs> it out of the assessment because the local authority aren't going to be concerned with any non-habitable spaces like hallways, bathrooms, utility spaces, etc. Um, so that's why it hasn't been included there. So for the purpose of what we're looking today, we're going to be looking at the impact on this first floor window number three. So bear that in mind when we're looking at the results for that particular window. So as I mentioned, vertical sky component is our main test and it looks at a measure of visible sky from the centre of a window. And the BRE guide states that diffuse daylight may be adversely affected if after a development, uh, the VSC is less than 27%, so that's your absolute test, and less than 0.8 times its former value, which of course is another way of saying up to 20%. So it, you can allow for up to a 20% loss to a window and it would still be deemed acceptable by the local authority under the BRE guide. Now this 20% threshold is actually uh, used across all of the tests, so bear that in mind for when uh, or dealing with, with construction that you can actually take up to 20% of a neighbour's light um, before it's impacted under the BRE guide. Daylight distribution only works on that relative loss and it's uh, again looking at that 0.8 times threshold so you can have 20% loss and it still be acceptable. So this is what's called a Waldron diagram. Has anybody seen one of these diagrams before? <coughs> They've been used um, for a number of years. Um, and it's a way of putting a 3D space into 2D, so kind of like that globe to atlas kind of idea. Uh, so here is your window number three and the view that window three can see with your pink <coughs> existing massing on the left and the blue massing on the right. Now you'll notice that in uh, the, a few slides ago you saw that they had a flat roof whereas in this scenario you can see it sort of kind of curves down from the centre of the window outwards and again that's the way that the, the Waldron diagram works. As you work your way out the impact on daylight is less than if you're looking directly out of the window, hence why there's more massing that's going to be um, directly in front of that window. Now, the maximum theoretical um, vertical sky component that a vertical window can get is around about 39.6%. 30, so if you were to take this whole diagram and get rid of all the colours, mm -hmm. if it was completely blank, completely unobstructed, that vertical window is going to get 39.6%. So, any score above 27% um, is what is deemed as acceptable. So in our existing scenario, this actually is just above what is <coughs> deemed as acceptable under the BRE guide. And then we move to our proposed scenario and compare the two, and we get a reduction ratio of 0.78, so just underneath that 0.8 threshold. So in effect, there's been a 22% loss to this window. Therefore, it fails the BRE recommendations. And so for any windows um, which fail this test, um, as with any other of the tests that fail, we as Daylight Sunlight Consultants need to find mitigating arguments or cut back your development to ensure that it meets these targets. So it's like the highest level of passing. So this is what a, a table of results looks like in our reports, um, and we look mostly and we focus on this ratio target on the on the right hand side anything falls under 0.8 that's when it flags up to us that we need to look into it uh, and see if there's anything that can be done to alleviate those failures so you can see windows one 
and three, experience a loss less than 0.8. So we're going to talk about how we're going to mitigate against losses like that. So with sunlight to windows, again this is taken from a centre point of the outside of a window, looking outwards. Uh, so we're going to again look at the Waldrum diagram, but it's slightly different this time. Um, so with sunlight it's a three-prong test, unlike the vertical sky component which only had two components to it. Um, so it has an absolute target, so 25% annually and 5% in the winter months it has to achieve. Um, it will be adversely effective if it falls short of that 20% threshold again and if it's reduced overall in absolute figures by more than 4% annually. So it has to hit those three criteria before it passes. So we actually find that um, neighbouring windows are, uh, it's almost harder to fail that, that particular test because there's more to it. So I'm going to put my wardroom diagram back up on the screen. But this time you'll notice there's a number of dots. Now there are red and blue dots in this scenario um, and you'll see that the red dots are higher up compared with the blue dots. So these dots rep each represent 1% of annual probable sunlight hours and for each window there will be a different array of dots depending on its orientation and dependent on the latitude of the location of your, of your proposal. Um, so I think in this scenario this is a, a London based test. Uh, so we've got mean statistical data based on a London site um, and it looks at the general splay of light throughout the year and sunlight and the position of the sun. So it's as simple as counting up the dots in the white area. So the amount of unobstructed dots gives us our annual probable sunlight score. So if you were to count up all of the red dots, I'm not going to ask you to do it on screen, I've got it on the right hand side here. So there's 28 in the summer and two in the winter, which gives our annual score of 30%. So now we need to look at the comparison between the existing and proposed scenario and see how many dots are covered up as a result of your development. So only a few dots have been covered up. So our annual probable sunlight hours is 27% in the proposed scenario, which is 2% more than our 25% absolute target, so it meets that criteria. It's got 2% in the winter. Now, although the target was 5%, it didn't actually experience any reduction because it, the target is 5%, but before we had 2%, now we've got 2%. There's no difference. So therefore, this particular window would meet those BRE recommendations, so we wouldn't need to go into any detail um, or explain the loss to this particular window. So this is what our table of results looks like for annual probable sunlight hours. As you can see on the right hand side, our ratios um, are all above, um, all above 0.8. Our window number one does experience a ratio loss which is less than 0.8 but over the whole year it doesn't uh, experience a loss more than 4% so it still meets those recommendations. So at this stage uh, we need to go back and look at what windows fail. Um, for most of our schemes, what we try and do is provide feedback to our clients to see, look, what can we do to the proposal in order for all windows to pass? Because ultimately, that's the best thing to supply the local authority with. Need me to go this way. Thank you. Um, I'm hiding something. Sorry, uh, I forgot that it was it was this this uh, PowerPoint instead of uh, that that projector up there. Um, yeah, so we're going to be looking at uh, ways of alleviating that loss. So first, most simple way to do it is cut back your development, which uh, I'm sure you'll appreciate is not the uh, most favoured uh, idea when it comes to uh, developers and dealing with developers. Uh, our suggestion of cutting back the most profitable part of your scheme isn't normally going to be uh, <laughs> taken very well. So it is an alternative uh, and a way to alleviate those failures but it tends not to be the case uh, we tend to provide mitigation uh, for those particular windows rather than actually cutting through as I said the most profitable parts of the scheme so this can be done by either chamfering through the roof profile closest to the windows that are affected so in this instance our windows down here our window number three if you can chamfer the closest corner um, with, with daylight and sunlight, as you're looking out that window, as with that wardroom diagram, the most important thing isn't necessarily the style of the building, but actually the overall silhouette of the building. So if you're able to bring that down and allow more sky visibility to that particular window, that window will achieve a higher level of daylight. Um, so there are different ways of doing this. We've got a stepped approach on the right hand side uh, and more of a sort of straight slice. Um, obviously the drawbacks of this 
I mentioned um, are that you are cutting away potential viability of the scheme because certainly for affordable housing schemes um, that aren't particularly profitable, um, you know, local authorities are going to need to have a certain massing before uh, the development becomes feasible. So sometimes it's something that we can't uh, help with in that situation, uh, but we can look at other alternative methodologies to get around it. What we can do and what we're uh, quite often instructed to do is do a maximum envelope exercise from the outset, so kind of work backwards. So instead of starting with the proposed design uh, and then cutting away at it, what we can provide is a jelly mould um, of something to work within, which is what uh, you know, many surveyors do. Problem being, again, is that we quite often in really tight sites give very modest massing, which is not going to be uh, feasible for the development. So it does have its drawbacks and there are infinite ways you can uh, skin a cat, as it were, uh, or cut away at your development to get exactly the same result. So a second method of mitigation that I'm going to talk about is what's called the mirror image methodology. Now this is applied where you have windows really close to the common boundary. So in this instance, our neighbouring property, which is on the left hand side, we've changed views now, uh, we've got the common boundary to the proposed site in this with this yellow line. So these neighbouring windows, because they're situated so close to the common boundary, they almost prejudice any further future development that's going to happen on that development site. Um, because they're so close, if you were to build exactly the same thing on the other side, would you feel like that is a fair scenario? Well, the BRE guide says that we can apply this mirror image methodology where windows are close to the common boundary. So we create a mirror image of this existing building on the boundary and we provide ourselves with an alternative VSC target. So we've got a vertical sky component target now of 15.7%, 15 15 which is far lower than what our proposal actually achieves. So if your proposed figure is um, more than your mirror image figure, then we can argue that it's actually met those alternative recommendations. Now, this mirror image methodology should be taken with a bit with a pinch of salt, um, particularly because if you have windows that are directly on a common boundary or they're right on the road, it's, you know, this is arguing that you can completely block them up and it's okay to do so, which, I mean, no local authority is going to argue that that's the case. And it's almost certainly going to give rise to serious rights of light risk as well. Um, so a third part, uh, third mitigating argument we can use, and this is particularly for larger commercial developments where you've got neighbouring balconies and overhangs which impinge on the light to their own property. So a balcony, <coughs> if you can imagine it, if you're standing out here, if we had a balcony that was directly over these windows, it's taking out the most valuable part of the sky from the perspective of the window. So just above the window is where you normally would receive a really good amount of sky. You put the balcony in place or some form of amenity or space or circulation space above that is coming over that window, you're cutting out a really serious portion of the sky. So even if you were to have a modest development, let's say over the top of uh, the building that we can see over there, even if it was a small development, because you're already kind of tunneled in from above, even a small development is going to cause a really big relative loss. So what we can actually do within our models <coughs> is switch off all of the balcony layers and test the scheme without those balconies in place. So without those balconies in place, obviously it achieves a much higher level um, of, of, of daylight. And we've actually done that in this scenario here with our window <coughs> number one, which is situated just, just underneath this overhang. So what we did is turned off everything, all the massing directly above this window. And in the existing scenario, we go from a 0.3%, which is virtually nothing, uh, to 25.2%, an enormous increase just from removing that balcony. Now, we have tested it again with the proposal in place, and we hit that, <laughs> luckily, we hit that, uh, that ratio bang on. So this actually meets the recommendations now, whereas previously, it didn't with that balcony and overhang in place. So that is a, um, what the BRE guide allows us to do. Um, is looking at taking away balconies and any obstructions that kind of surround the window um, because you're arguing that it's the fault of the existing neighbouring building rather than the proposal itself and actually the proposal <coughs> is relatively modest.
So other mitigating arguments we can employ, uh, mostly this is for urban developments, is at matching the height of existing buildings. So if you've got a number of high-rise existing buildings around the site and you're only building to, let's say, not, not quite as high or some equal height to those buildings, a local authority is going to look at it and uh, see that it's obviously fitting within the area itself. Um, similarly, if you have a row of terrace properties, for example, uh, and let's say five of those properties have already had dormer extensions or ear extensions, matching the similar properties in that vicinity is something that's really common so you can argue you know if my neighbor's done it obviously it's going to be acceptable for me you know it would be an argument in their favor um, projecting <coughs> wings very very similar to our balconies and overhangs so with projecting wings or if an existing building has an, a, uh, a projecting wing uh, as part of its own building and you've got your development on the other side so kind of creating a tunneling effect if it fails the test, what we can do is take away this projecting wing from our model, retest it, and so long as it passes the test without the projecting wing in place, we can argue that it is the fault of the wing and the existing property, rather than the proposal itself that is the reason for that particular shortfall. Um, one thing that is really important um, is determining room uses. As mentioned, the daylight and sunlight guidance and local authorities are really interested in domestic properties and habitable rooms within domestic properties, so kitchens, living rooms, bedrooms, that kind of thing, large studies, um, <coughs> and mixed use rooms are all going to be considered by the local authority and they want to protect those uh, and the, the amenity to those types of rooms, whereas non habitable rooms like utility spaces, WCs, aren't going to be impacted. So if we can look at a project, if there are a number of failing windows, one of the first things we'll do is look to determine what is the use of that room, if we can, you know, if we can from the outside. Quite often it's easy to see where the toilets are located, either with obscure glazing, um, you know, soil pipes that are on the outside of buildings as well, they're quite easy to identify um, without, you know, trespassing and getting onto the neighbour's land, you know. Um, we do what we can from, from the side that we're on. Um, although I have had a number of you know, dodgy sites where I've had to kind of reach over fences and take photos and all that kind of thing. But never, never jumping over the fence, never trespassing. So uh, the, first, the final thing is looking at the urban location of the site. So if you're in an urban location, additional flexibility tends to be applied um, primarily because the access to daylight and sunlight is generally more <laughs> is generally worse um, in the first instance. So more flexibility is going to be applied. Now, all of this, the BRE guide is ultimately guidance. Um, we try as much as we can to achieve full compliance, but in most instances, we will have to go back to our clients and say, look, there are some failing windows, but here's the way to get around them, and that's what I've explained today. So the local authority are going to be interested in the impact on neighbouring properties first and foremost, particularly when they get objections. Uh, in some instances, if there are just no objections, even if it's a large development, sometimes local authorities, because they're so busy, will just look to put through applications which don't get any objections. So um, first and foremost, they're going to look at the impact on neighbouring amenity. Secondly, they're going to be looking at the um, light levels within a proposal itself. Now this tends to be only for developments where you have new basement accommodation which naturally have a lot less light that is receivable so they want to know that the future occupants of that particular building are going to enjoy that light and have a reasonable amount of light so we look at what's called the BRE within assessment. Uh, we would also look to undertake these tests for commercial to domestic conversions because commercial premises tend to be um, not the same sort of size. They tend to be you know, a lot more deep rooms if they were previously offices or warehouses, for example, and they've been converted into domestic accommodation. Um, the local authority are going to want to see that these new blocks are achieving good levels of daylight and sunlight inside. So I've got a few tips um, on how to increase natural light within rooms. They seem, to be honest, they're pretty obvious. Making the windows bigger, I mean you couldn't have guessed that one. Um, increasing the window head height, this is particularly important for basement accommodation. As you can imagine, if you are in, in your basement looking out the window, to be honest, you're likely to be looking at a light well, 
um, or some form of wall outside. So if you're able to paint those walls white and also have the window as high up in the room as possible to allow that natural light to penetrate deeper into the room, that's always going to look good. Um, we very rarely see with the new guidance that came out this year, so this is June 2022, and a lot of uh, surveyors in this industry have been very busy over the last few months all changing their software um, because it's all now superseded. So what we used to undertake for internal daylight was what's called the ADF test or average daylight factor test which looked at an average amount of daylight within a room and would um, look at uh, including reflectances within the room, the surfaces uh, within, the, within the room. So we want to always stipulate that you have white walls, white ceilings, medium wooden floors, that kind of thing to maximise the internal reflectance. But what the new guidelines are now using, instead of the average daylight factor test, we're looking more at the illuminance at each point within a room rather than a geometric based test which the average daylight factor test was. So average daylight factor was essentially looking at a uh, comparison between the size of the window and the size of the room. So you make the window bigger, you make the room smaller, you improve your score. Whereas now uh, with, with this new method of testing as outlined in the 2022 guide, we look at the illuminance or lux level at a working plane height within the room. So now we have these contours um, which show um, at every single point within the room how bright it is. Um, and so it identifies usually towards the back of the room or really deep rooms that they're not lit to a certain lux level. You have to now hit that lux level over a certain percentage of the working plane. So they are harder to pass and so these tips are really important to improve the scores to ensure that you're actually meeting those recommendations. So light coloured interiors, really obvious, uh, high transmittance glazing, most modern, tr most modern glazing has um, slightly thinner frames, it's better transmittance anyway, um, but we will always try the most favourable scores that we can as long as it's reasonably practicable to do so. Uh, and also reducing room sizes is another important way that you can uh, improve those daylight factor scores. So by taking the room closer to the window, there's obviously less uh, of the room that has to receive light from the windows itself. Now, ways we can get around this and make a room smaller is by building in areas of non-habitable space. So for example, in a bedroom, you'd be looking to maybe put in an ensuite, which we wouldn't need to test because that area is non-habitable. So we'd be able to cordon that bit off. We would also be able to cut off any sections of the building which had fixed floor to ceiling storage as well. So any of that that can be implemented is always going to be good for your daylight score. Um, so that um, kind of covers the first half of the presentation where we're talking about the internal daylight and the impact on neighbours for planning. I, I was wondering if anyone had any questions at this stage um, over, over the planning stuff or whether you want me to move on to legal rights of light. One simple question, where does the 25 degree rule come from? Why is it 25? Why <coughs> really good question. I, I'm going to go back, not to the 25 degree slide, but to the Waldron diagram slide. So the 25 degree test, um, if you had, uh, for example, uh, yeah, yeah, so I mentioned the vertical sky component, the target was 27% as an absolute figure. So if you had a building over here, I don't know why I'm doing that, I can use this. Um, if you had a building across the whole horizon, bang on that 25 degrees, that gives you those 27%, that 27% VSC. So because of that 27% um, target that you have, if you can fit everything under that 25 degree plane, it will all automatically meet that test. So that's why we, uh, why we use the 25 degree rule. You may have also used the 45 degree rule. Anybody? Yeah? So this, the 45 degree rule, although we don't speak about it today, is another test and probably even more common uh, where you have, let's say, a row of properties, you've got windows, all rear windows facing towards the rear garden, your neighbour wants to do maybe a single storey extension to the side, so it's for um, 25 degree rule is looking at windows that look directly at a proposal, 45 degree rule is for developments to the side of the proposal. So if it's to an angle or perpendicular to a proposal, what we'll want to do is draw a 45 degree line down 
if you're looking on a rear elevation view, draw it from the corner of your highest point of your proposal over the neighbouring window. And if it passes over the neighbouring window on plan and elevation, then it fails that test. And so we would look again to, to implement those further daylight and sunlight tests which are laid out in the BRE guide. Why is there no consistency from the councils and their approach on the angles from the central window, the side of the window, 15 degrees, 30 degrees, 45 degrees, or 60 degrees? <coughs> there's no national standard on this when every council <coughs> seems like they can do whatever they feel. Yes, it, I mean, it is. Um, I mean, it allows us to be, I suppose, flexible in our approach. We only, we only employ the, the 25 and 45 degree rule test from, from our perspective. So, I mean, I haven't worked with any particular councils who have used it, anything other than that. Um, but when it comes to looking at, I mean, someone asking for or achieving a 65 degree angle, it's still going to lead to the same conclusion that they need to look further into the daylight and sunlight tests. Where have you seen the, uh, the 15 degree <coughs> rule used? Um, I think Enfield are at 15. 15 yeah, degrees? Yeah, I think it was done at 15. We had to take them to appeal. As in they wouldn't allow anything above 15 degrees? Yeah, from, from, the, from the central window. And we get some, we get some actually working from the side of the window. As yeah, well. okay. So it, I mean, you can't build anything within that. <laughs> Surely the neighbouring building is already at probably 65 yeah, degrees already. We'd have to do a light survey, obviously. Okay. Yeah. I wonder if they're looking just to try and refuse as many as possible. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know. But yeah, it's unusual. I've not heard of 15, the 15 degree rule being used before, but that, that's really interesting. Okay. As I said, please do stop me at any point if you want to ask any questions. But thank you for asking questions and allowing me to have a, a little drink as well. So, legal rights of light, completely separate to planning. Make sure developers are aware, and we need to make sure developers are aware of the risks in building when you do have planning permission. So, because it's completely separate test to planning um, that we undertake, uh, and the tests for rights of light tend to be more onerous on a developer, we have to be really careful in. Uh, particularly with schemes that have permission and developers who think, right, let's plough on with the development, I'm not going to have any impact. Um, it's applied to all room types, unlike planning. So now we don't just bring in our bedrooms, our living rooms, our kitchens, but we're also taking into consideration even small bathrooms, storage space, garages, um, circulation space, stairwells, etc. And we also look at the impact on non-domestic buildings as well. So even if you've got a commercial space next door, local authority aren't going to be too concerned with the impact on that, but now we're on the legal rights of light side, they can make a claim. So uh, how do you acquire a right of light? Generally speaking, probably 99% of cases you will acquire a right of light when a window aperture has been in place for at least 20 years. And this is highlighted in the Prescription Act of 1832. Hasn't really changed much since then. Um, it's been a long while, uh, but a right is gained after 20 years enjoyment. So once a window has been in place for 20 years and has enjoyed uninterrupted light, so the same amount of sky has been received over the neighbouring building, it then becomes an easement, an illegal easement that they have a right to. Um, so where windows are less than 20 years old, it cannot automatically be ruled out that rights of light um, do not exist because there are some scenarios where you can get transferred rights from an old aperture to a new one tends to be the case really with commercial schemes where uh, a building is in place, maybe it's a little dilapidated, it's taken down, new building is put in place but the window apertures are in exactly the same place. So it's one thing to consider uh, and a word of warning really that just because a window uh, and a building is brand new doesn't necessarily mean we can rule out rights of light. But generally speaking, newer buildings don't have rights of lights when they hit that 20 years, that 20 year period, um, they enjoy it. Um, so we undertake uh, our rights of light calculations from a working plane height of 850 mil off the floor from within a room and we're looking to see whether each point on the working plane receives at least 0.2% of the sky's illumination. Well, what does that look like in real terms? It's effectively, if you were doing it by eye, if I was kneeling down at tabletop height, whoops, I would be looking out at the window and seeing if I could see a patch of sky. 
if I can, generally speaking, this point is adequately well lit. There we go. I'm just going to pop this back on. That was good. Um, so 0.2% of the sky's illumination equates to what is known as adequate light. And we do that on thousands of points within each neighbouring room and see which parts can and can't receive adequate sky before and after a development. So we do these contours. So this is our room. This is our window number three here. And you can see the contour faintly. Uh, we're going to see it much clearer here. So this is our plan view. You see this rectangle here over on the right-hand side with the line through is our window. And this is our assumed uh, room uh, for window number three. <coughs> so the green area towards the rear of the room and closer to the window reveals is the areas of the room which do not have adequate sky in the first instance anyway. So that area is what's deemed by the courts as poorly lit. The white area is our well-lit area. What happens when we put our proposal in place? We look at the red <coughs> zone within our contour, and this is our area of loss. So what we're looking to see uh, for rights of light calculations, uh, we use what's called the 50-50 rule. So if it's dropped below that 50% threshold in the after scenario, in this case it has, so it's dropped to 49%, so only just under the threshold, a legal right of light injury has occurred to this room. Now we would do this for each and every neighbouring room and every neighbouring property and calculate all of the losses together uh, in our uh, results table. So this is our results table you can see here and I've highlighted the most important results which is where it's, the light has dropped to less than 50% in the after scenario. So this is what we're always looking for in our after development column. We're always looking to see if it's dropped below that 50% threshold to see if the neighbours might have a legal claim against your development, even if it has planning permission. So this neighbour could, well, if they do have legal rights, um, they could come to the neighbour and serve an injunction over the development. Unlikely that, that that's going to be the case. They're more, more likely that they're going to try and get as much compensation out of the developer as possible. Most people will try and do that to avoid all the litigation. Um, but th yeah, as I said, this is the most important column. And then we calculate, depending on where the loss is within the room and the, how much light they have, what we use is what's called the equivalent first zone, or EFZ. I'm not sure if you can see that from where you're sitting. But this column on the right-hand side is our most important column, which totals up all of the losses within that property, depending on the level of severity of loss. And that's why we have these front, first, second, and make weight zones within a room and they're all calculated to give us this overall equivalent first zone figure for each property. And this figure, this 5.35 metres squared, would then be used as a basis of negotiations with your, with your developer. So if you're proving to the de developer that, that there is 5.35 metres squared of loss, you would then equate, uh, based on that foot squared or metre squared loss, uh, a monetary figure from that. So that's how it's derived. What I do want to briefly talk about is these windows here. So windows uh, 1, 1A, so if you remember in the first few slides we had a, a hallway window which we didn't include for planning, we've now included it for rights of light. Uh, windows 1, 1A and 2 have less than 50% in the first scenario. So what happens then? Um, if you've got less than 50% already, what can you build? Well, the answer from a legal rights of, li rights of light perspective is if you build anything beyond uh, the massing that's already there and you cause any further loss to these rooms, you automatically cause an infringement. So you have to be really careful where you have very dimly lit rooms. This tends to be the case uh, from a domestic perspective where you've got you know, side windows facing directly in onto a neighbour that's enjoyed light for 20 years but are really poorly lit by their nature because they're currently looking onto a wall. If you're then extending your house out towards the boundary and infringing on that light, it's almost certainly going to give rise to a rights of light um, case. So um, that is something that's really important to consider because anything under 50% is deemed as precious by the courts. So, the remedy for neighbours. First and foremost, their legal right of light, uh, their legal right is to an injunction. Now, whilst most cases don't result in an injunction, the risk is always there. So our developers need to be made aware that they can't just go ahead with bills and pay off neighbours 
generally speaking they can, <coughs> but our main focus and to highlight the risks to our developer clients is that the injunction is always what the NABAD does have the legal right to. Um, the second is compensation. Probably 95% of cases end up either being compensated or, well, actually I'd say quite a lot of cases as well just don't materialise because neighbours don't know about legal rights of light. It's becoming a lot more common nowadays because we now have a number of firms who effectively ambulance chase um, developments. Uh, so they see a big development that's been passed and they canvass all the neighbours. Uh, so say, oh, we can, we can do a no-win, no-fee uh, on that basis. We can get you some compensation. Obviously, it's great for the neighbours because they're made aware of rights of light, um, but it has made it a bit of a nightmare for, um, for um, developers because the neighbours are now so much more aware of legal rights of light risk, uh, and so developers are having to put so much more into their insurance policies. The excesses and the insurance policy figures have gone through the roof as well. Um, so developers are now not only having to deal with all these rights of light cases, you know, it's putting a hold on their developments. They're paying out a lot more nowadays than they have done previously. And neighbours feel like they have a bit more of a leg to stand on because they know more about rights of light. So when I was talking about the injunction, um, it is possible for one to be awarded. And this is um, a case, uh, probably the most, one of the most famous cases, which is the High Cross and Heaney case from 2010. Um, so this is in Leeds. So kind of 2007, 2008, the developer on the left, High Cross, wanted to build these additional stories. So the sixth and, uh, sixth and seventh story on top of their block on the left-hand side. And Mr Heaney's building on the right-hand side, which is an old bank building, an old listed building, um, was being affected by, was or was going to be affected by these proposed floors. So High Cross intended to look at the uh, look at the light loss. They got rights of light surveyors involved. They calculated the light loss and could see that there was a loss to Heaney's building. And in overall terms, it equated to 1% of the entirety of the building space was being reduced. So a 1% loss, Mr High Cross thought, OK, well, there's obviously not going to be much of a risk, but I'd like to still get closure on that risk uh, and offer Heaney some money. Uh, so the compensation figure was estimated around 225000 that High Cross wanted to pay Heaney. Heaney maintained the whole time that the light was the most important thing to him and not the compensation, and he couldn't be compensated for these ancient lights which had been enjoyed. So High Cross decided to start building um, with this risk in place. With no, they effectively looked to self-insure, so they put some money aside and thought, well, there's no way an injunction is going to be awarded on a 1% loss. High Cross then built these two floors. Uh, they sold <coughs> off the two floors as well, had tenants uh, that were due to be in there, and they went to the courts to seek a declaration that the courts couldn't award an injunction on uh, Mr Heaney's building. This backfired, and um, they were actually told that they had to rip down the two stories they just built and sold off at an estimated cost between one and a half and two and a half million pounds to, to obviously take that down. So because Heaney had held out that he didn't want compensation, the light was the most important thing, the courts awarded that injunction. And so it was due to be heard in the Court of Appeal. Uh, and uh, they, it never got to the Court of Appeal because the deal was made on the court steps, but it's estimated that uh, Mr Heaney got paid approximately £2 million for the loss of light because he'd held out and because, uh, you know, High Cross had pushed so hard. Um, it's, yeah, I actually had, in a, interestingly, in a CPD, I was giving the CPD to, to a client and um, one of them piped up and been texting the boss from High Cross who was actually in that courtroom um, at the time and we had a good conversation and previously you know we'd, we'd estimated that the compensation might have sat around you know one million but I think it was actually closer to two million obviously undisclosed but everyone has their price um, obviously in this instance it was enough to get it over the line so they didn't have to rip it down but this case has really put it into perspective that injunctions can happen and developers really should get closure on the risk before they start building work because it can have serious catastrophic consequences. 
Now, a more recent case, Beaumont versus Florala, it was a 2010 case. Again, it reaffirmed the threat of an injunction because a, a mandatory injunction was awarded. In this instance, I don't think the building work has been ripped down yet. They're still in conversation, but in, uh, in lieu of that, the damages were estimated, again, around 350 grand. Um, so we're talking about fairly hefty <coughs> figures when it comes to legal rights of light cases, which can eat a lot into the profit of a scheme. Um, so really important to consider this. Um, one thing that was really important to take from the Beaumont and Florala case um, was that actually the light loss, although there was some light loss, I think it was around 280 square feet, um, although there was that material loss of light, the most important part of it that from the court's perspective was actually the conduct of the parties and the conduct of the developer. So each time, at each stage, the developer had been um, saying that they can, oh, don't worry, it's not really going to have an impact. It, we can just compensate, we can just compensate, it will be fine. Um, but they actually took valuation into consideration as well. So they, um, the impacted properties, Beaumont's properties, were high-end offices in London which had become dimmer and therefore the, the rents that they were able to charge were a lot less than when it had been a, a nicer, brighter space. So they looked at the valuation difference uh, and considered this, not, not just the, the Waldron methodology which we'd used previously. Similarly, um, just because you fail to object at a planning stage doesn't mean that you can't object then at rights of light stage. So if you have a neighbour who doesn't pipe up the whole time until you start building, you might think, OK, well, he's obviously not bothered <coughs> by the development and he won't be able to be, bring an injunction. Well, this is what happened in this case. They made no qualms at the, at the planning stage. Once it had been started to build, they put in their injunction, they put in their objection on rights of light, and that injunction was then awarded. So it reaffirmed that threat. Really important for your developer clients um, to, to make sure that they deal with it in a friendly and sensible manner, assessing the risk, impacting the neighbours, uh, etc. So the second remedy, which is a much more common way that we deal with rights of light cases, is out of court. So out of court settlements. Um, and the compensation, generally speaking, is based on what we call the book value methodology, by which we take a, a yield of the particular area you're working in. So in central London locations, your investment yield of a property tends to be fairly low, which will elevate that first uh, book value figure. So we value light at five pound per square foot, and we use our loss, so we convert our 5.35 meters squared into foot squared, multiply it by five, divided by your yield, and you get this book value figure for each and every neighboring property. So a, table of a typical table of results will have all of your neighboring properties listed and a figure as to each neighboring property. So you can almost go into each neighboring property when, you're, when I'm speaking to my clients and identify the different levels of risk and look at the different rooms which are impacted to ascertain the level of risk. But overall, when you're just looking at a figure, and certainly when the insurers are looking at our reports to be able to provide uh, an indemnity policy um, based on the rights of light risk, they will be looking at these figures. So in this instance, the book value for that, um, that property we were looking at with the five windows is around about six grand. For um, negotiations to take place, usually an uplift is applied to get to a figure where the neighbour is happy that they're willing to accept it. We're seeing nowadays that it's closer to kind of five, six times that book value figure. So for that single neighbouring property, um, we'll be potentially looking around about 30 grand payout if they were to bring a successful claim. But it doesn't stop there. You know, that negotiation isn't limited to that five times. Historically, we have used around 2.7 times as a starting point from a developer's point of view because in this Carl Saunders and Dick McNeil um, case from 1986, 2.7 times the book value was awarded um, um, to the neighbour. Uh, so it just gave um, rights of light surveyors a basis of where to start. But really, we're seeing neighbours kind of do deals at five to six times based on a book value methodology. But there is also a way that um, neighbours can argue uh, that the, the uplift should be a lot higher than your book value methodology, and an alternative method should actually be used 
to calculate that compensation. And that is called the share of development profit analysis. So what we do there, and it tends to be only for really profitable high-rise schemes. Again, I'm going to use our favourite window over here as an example. Uh, if you had a very, very <coughs> high-rise building, let's say 20 storeys going directly across uh, maybe 10 metres from the window, actually the level of loss within the room doesn't change much because it's so close and so high the actual physical level of loss won't change much between let's say the 10th and the 20th story but the profit that the developer's going to make is going to be huge on that portion of the development so what we look to do is cut back their development to a level which doesn't cause an injury to this room and see how much massing would have to be removed and derive a profit figure from that massing. So let's say you have to take five floors off, you'd calculate the profit for that particular development that those five floors are going to be giving to the developer. Now, in this Tamara's case, uh, we had a neighbouring stair core and the book value compensation would have been estimated around about three grand. So our book value figure at three grand, let's say we do our three to five times uplift, maybe 10 to 15 grand as a compensation figure based on that methodology. In this instance, the courts argued that the profit figure from the developers was more relevant in this case and felt more fair. So they uh, calculated that the bit that needed to be cut back, the profit was 150 grand, and the courts awarded a third share of that to this particular neighbour who was only experiencing a three grand loss to a bunch of stairs. So that's almost a 17 times uplift on the book value. So you'll find developers want to go in around here uh, and try and make offers based on a modest uplift on the book value. If you're a neighbour, you're looking to employ the share of development profit analysis, certainly where it's applicable, just to elevate that compensation figure. So what we would always suggest is design with rights of light in mind. So certainly if you're working with developers, making them aware <laughs> of rights of light is really important from the outset of a project. Agree compensation with affected parties and close off any deeds of release um, of rights of light of the neighbouring properties before you start building. Then you've got some clearance of when you can build. Uh, ensuring against the risk <coughs> tends, again, only to be towards the start of a project. If neighbours have already made objections, I suppose it's like trying to get health insurance for an arm that's already broken and then trying to get claim it back. Um, if a neighbour has already made a physical claim and come forward, either the excesses are going to be so big that it's not worth getting the insurance policy or they're going to be just, they're just going to say we won't insure it. Serving light obstruction notices is something that you can do for windows that are less than 20 years old. So if you have windows that are approaching <coughs> 20 years when you're looking to build, you can serve a legal light obstruction notice to effectively start the clock back at zero. So they'll uh, have that 20 years enjoyment and that will start back to zero again. Um, so you can build in front of those windows. You can compulsory purchase the rights of light tends only to be for schemes in local interest. So local authorities can appropriate the land and then an injunction cannot happen. So the levels of compensation that have to be paid out there tend to be more of a mandatory sort of book value because they don't have a threat of, threat of an injunction um, behind them. So compulsory purchase is very rare, it tends to only be in very large local authority schemes. Um, um, so it's not something we deal with quite a lot. Uh, more we deal with the, the rights of light cases where we pass on our, our figures to the insurers. They will then insure our clients against any risk. So our recommendations finally is to highlight rights of light risk to all of our clients uh, and uh, because we have actually had architects in the, in the past. So primarily we work with developers and their architects. Um, we've had previously where architects have um, drawn up some drawings for their development, it's got planning permission, developers gone ahead to build, they've almost come to the fin finished part of the build and then their neighbours come forward with this legal right of light claim and they uh, sub sub subsequently the developers have sued the architects because they've blamed them for designing them something that hadn't had rights of light risk in mind. So what we would always suggest to our architects, I'm not sure there's any architects here today, um, but uh, we would also, uh, we would say look, make sure the risk is identified in and in place first and address it in any terms and conditions that basically you don't deal with legal easements, making sure that you're covered. Um, if your developer clients try and come to you and say, you've built me something that is um, legally uh, not particularly good. So what you want to do, most important thing, ensure the risk, 
in, and ensure the risk is identified, quantified, and a strategy is in place so that we avoid an injunction happening, which is obviously the most catastrophic scenario. Obviously, an injunction is a pretty depressing way to end the presentation, <laughs> uh, but I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I hope you've learned something from, from uh, the daylight and sunlight and rights of light stuff that we've gone through. Does anybody have any questions on the legal rights of light stuff? Yeah, so if you had a permissive development extension or loft bush, yes. where the neighbours already built theirs and it's three metres out and they've got a window on the side that's been there for more than 20 years, you put your PD application in for certificate of loft development to build your extension. Yeah. Right up against theirs because it's bound to boundary. In theory, they could put it up, build it, and then the neighbour can then take them for the right to life. Yeah. 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 Because you, those you mentioned ambulance chasers, that they moved into the domestic sector yet, are they still very much in the <laughs> <laughs> Well, I would have to be careful. I don't know who uh, who I'm talking to. Here. <laughs> uh, I've generally seen it for larger developments, probably more worth their time. Uh, where there's a number of developments and there's a big developer obviously making a lot of profit. So for domestic extensions, I would imagine, um, either, well, there, I'm sure there will be companies out there looking to, to get some work out of it. Can I just ask, um, with the, the issue of the injunction, you mentioned that particularly large case and that the, the judge awarded demolition, partial demolition, but you can, it sounds like you can defeat that by just paying them off. But the, is that from the court? The court saying you, you demolish or you pay X? Uh, no, so it wasn't an option. It was a mandatory in injunction in that case. So they were ordered to remove the building. Right. And then it was at the Court of Appeal that they came back to appeal it. High Cross came back to appeal it to say, well, no, we, you know, this has already been sold off. It's going to cost X amount. We need to be able to pay off <laughs> the neighbouring party, which they were eventually able to do on the court steps. But... It was, you know, just until that so last stage. Set that, that would be necessary the, the outcome of another case they may not get an appeal. Absolutely. Or yeah, so yeah. actually that Florala case, the Beaumont Florala case, they had an option. So there was a, either you pay them 350 grand or the injunction happens. The reason why there was a difference in that one, because um, in Beaumont's building, um, the people who were objecting, they had in the process of this whole um, debacle had actually got tenants in um, during the process. And so those tenants who were actually there enjoying the light, they would be the ones who are actually affected. Yeah. They would have to be on board as well. Mm -hmm. So the court said, look, as long as they're on board and they bring forward an injunction as well, you can have your injunction. Alternatively, 350 grand. I've got two questions, actually. One is just a matter of interest. Yeah. Um, as to whether or not you act for both developers and for individuals looking to take a right light. Not in the same case. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a bit dodgy. Take two sets of fees. Yeah. Uh, but yes, it's yes, the answer. Okay. Um, my second question was, in a brownfield development site, if the existing development had already, the, the existing building had already been demolished, mm. when you bought the brownfield site to develop, would you be able to take into account the massing of the old building that was on the site in your before In our before figures, because obviously that's going to make a massive difference, isn't yes. it? Mm. I think it depends on the amount of time uh, that has elapsed. Mm. Um, so if you had a, a, a brownfield site, building's demolished, 20 years passes, mm. then I would say your neighbouring windows, I wouldn't be putting that existing um, building on site. Um, but if it's anything less than that, I think to be prudent, we would look at, well, firstly, the worst case scenario, which is from nothing to something, and then look at what was there previously, because those rights of light are enjoyed over a certain period of time. And of course, if, if you change that, if you reduce it, obviously you're getting more light, but you don't automatically get a right to all that additional light until that 20 years has passed. Mm. So. Um, if it was uh, going the other way, um, so if you had um, your, your brownfield site hasn't been demolished yet, maybe there was you know, two new floors put on the top of it, um, the neighbour would be able to object. As long as they do it within one year, they can object to this, this development. Um, but once that has been in place for a year, that has interrupted that amount of light, so the new um, massing that you would need to test if it had been there for a year already would be the larger massing. Mm. 
I hope that helps. Yeah, but you, do you sometimes have to be detectives to actually Absolutely. work out? As, yeah. As a yeah. What what should be and. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you probably gathered, I mean, because there's been so many different outcomes to court cases, it's almost like, well, what would happen in a court scenario? Would, would an injunction be awarded? Would compensation be awarded? I mean, it kind of gives us a bit more flexibility, but at the same time, it doesn't set us a solid precedent as to how we should do it. So these negotiations can be really interesting, um, certainly um, across different projects. And the compensation figures, you know, wildly different, even on the same site. So I'm working on one in London, um, you know, in Fitzrovia, um, where I've got a number of neighbours uh, all looking onto the same site, all with different impacts in terms of book value, uh, <coughs> and so all getting different levels of compensation. And of course, in, in the compensation agreements, it all says, you know, it must be kept strictly confidential, <laughs> you know, what neighbours are like. So I've had one neighbour go, oh, well, he's getting 150 grand. Y yeah, but the loss is not the same. It, what, why? You just don't put that in an email because you've almost <laughs> voided yourself of, of your agreement by saying that you've been speaking to neighbours. So we do have to be really careful when you've got a number of neighbours that you're acting on behalf of uh, and making it clear that it is intended that it's fo the focus is on the, that book value methodology mm. and we deal with every neighbour really separately. But it, it feels quite difficult from my perspective when you've got someone who's accepted three times and someone who has held out for seven times and you almost feel, oh, I feel a bit bad for the other guy who I didn't get that compensation for, but they, they weren't bothered. So they have to consider that. Yes? Can I just, this is on a sort of human psychology issue. I'm just intrigued. So I deal a lot with party wars and yes. legal matters. With, in those negotiations, I bet you often find, or imagine you often find one particular party who's incredibly difficult to deal with, and presumably with the risk of an injunction, you've probably got to advise your client, you've got to pay him off. Yeah. I can see how you probably if spend I'm honest, 80% of your job time on. It's who's next door, yeah. rather than the loss. Yeah. Um, it's who you know, as they say, um, because if you've got a neighbouring, uh, as I went to a site last week, and I scanned a neighbouring property, it wasn't my project, but I went into a property uh, to undertake a point cloud laser scan for the purpose of our assessment, and the first thing it said, uh, I could see on the wall that was uh, a barrister specialising in easements <laughs> and thought, ah, oh, I'm really glad this isn't my project <laughs> because I wouldn't want to be the developer against someone like that. Yeah. Um, but right. it's, uh, yeah, it's really important looking at the human side of things and looking at how you deal with it because conduct of the parties is so important. Thank you. Thank you. you mentioned it. So is there like a one-year cut-off from completion of building to the end of when you're allowed to make an injunction? Yes, really good point to make. Um, I, I glazed over it very quickly. Um, so a neighbour, 99% of cases, has one year once the structure, main structure, main external structure of the building is complete. So that is where your clock starts. So once you've done all external mashing, it doesn't have to be from exchange or completion. It's once the interruption to the light occurs, you then have, your neighbour has a year to object. So once that year has elapsed, developers are in the clear. So that's what your, your policies are going to be covering you for. Can they ask for compensation thereafter? They, uh, well, at that kind of, because their claim is gone and the, the light has been interrupted for a year, that will be their basis for the claim of compensation. Just so there would be compensation left, but they could still seek compensation. I, I, I have still had neighbours who, you know, a fence was built five years ago, and sorry, I roll my eyes because, you know, I, you see these inquiries come in and you think, me, why haven't you done anything about it? You know, it's from a neighbour's perspective, surely, if <laughs> if you've uh, you know if you've had that development up for five years, why haven't you said anything? If it's really that important to you? You've just fallen out with it over somebody else. <laughs> uh, clear, clearly, clearly. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. That's very good.